All right. Um, so we're waiting to see um, Brooke, who will be our next presenter. But while we are um, waiting on Brooke, I would just again um, reiterate the opportunity for you to see the rest of the presentations. This is our um, 13th annual conference um, that is going on um, this year. And maybe this hopefully will give you encouragement uh, to think about for your students for next year. Next year's will be our 14th. It will take place um, on April 23rd. Um, of 2021, so we're always looking, uh, already looking ahead uh, to that um, particular opportunity. Um, and so we encourage you to think about that uh, for next year. Um, and again, I would simply say there are going to be opportunities for students, as you'll see, in all kinds of areas. Um, one of the things that we were not able to do this year that we have previously done is also um, group presentations. So you can think about that. Um, and I know Dr. Martinez, you are there and I wondered if you might, since we have a minute or two and I know I'm putting you on the spot, you were had some students who had planned on potentially doing something with a group presentation. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about what they had what they were going to do? It might be an encouragement for others if that's not too much to ask. Uh, no, not at all. Hold on. I, I'll start my video um, so that you don't just see a black wall um, <laughs> or a black screen. Uh, yeah, so uh, students from my Shakespeare experience class that happened this past fall were going to put together a panel where they were showcasing um, alternative adaptations to Shakespeare. So Amanda Browning did post, uh, on, I think it's under poster presentations. She has, um, uh, she and Katie Kidwell did a presentation on Hamlet set in Oklahoma in sort of the Dust Bowl period. Uh, we had another student from theater, Ryan Lucas, who set uh, Hamlet in space, kind of like a Star Wars version of, of Hamlet. Um, and then we had um, Jimmy Shindewolf had done a presentation on uh, putting Shakespeare in sort of like a kind of very bloody type of high school setting. Uh, doing more of a darker side of like uh, the movies like 10 Things I Hate About You, which are a bit more upbeat. And mm -hmm. then um, we had John Coyne, who's also in theater. Uh, he, he actually wrote a full, full on new adaptation, um, setting a Shakespeare play in, um, in like a mob setting in like the 1930s, 19, 1940s Chicago. He had it down to like the, the perfect kind of dialogue and dialect for the period. So they were gonna do those. Uh, and, I, and I think so far only Amanda was the one who, who moved forward with it. But I'm hoping that next, next year, uh, next conference, uh, since some of them will still be around as students, oh. that we can encourage them to do it. Uh, because I know John wanted to do a, a live reading of it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Martinez. Sure. So you can see that there are other possibilities out there and things that um, people can do. And so we want to encourage um, both the students and from the faculty standpoint to think about um, the different kinds of opportunities that are out there for our students. Um, and so um, just again, before we um, enter into this last presentation, because I do see uh, that Brooke has joined us. So welcome, Brooke. Um, just again, to Thank everybody who helped with um, putting together this conference from the students who selected the presenters and helped edit the program to, again, I want to give a big shout out to Julie Spots. Um, Julie was responsible for all of the work on the website, which um, truly made this conference possible. Um, and Brielle Lotney, who put together um, some of the advertising for it, et cetera, um, to all the faculty and students who have put forward their uh, their work to for us to enjoy. And so just want to thank everybody. Um, and so at this point, um, we're going to hear from our last uh, presenter this afternoon. And our last presenter this afternoon um, is Brooke Pandria. And so welcome, Brooke. Hello. All right, great. We want good, good that we can hear you. Um, and so welcome. We're glad you are here. Um, and so I'm going to very quickly introduce Brooke and then 
turn it over to her and um, let her give her presentation. Um, so Brooke is a senior um, in art history and history, so she's double majoring, um, graduating uh, later this year, um, and her presentation is coming uh, directly out of her senior honors thesis, um, and the title of her presentation is Wanders Through the West, Analysis of the Works of Alexei Savrasov in Relation to Nationalism and Realism in Russia, and so it's all yours, Brooke. Sweet. Um, let's do this Okay. Okay. Um, can you guys see my slideshow and everything? Yes, we can. Sweet. Okay. So, like Dr. Hefe said, my name is Brooke Bandria, um, and this presentation comes directly from my uh, senior honors thesis that I've been working on with uh, Dr. Murray. Um, and it is titled Wanders Through the West An Analysis of Works by Alexei Savrasov. Uh, in relation to nationalism and realism in Russia. And the paper that I wrote is essentially a visual analysis of his works um, that he started from the time he was a student at the Moscow School of Painting um, until his death and looking at his works uh, in relation to his lyrical landscape style and in relation to nationalism in Russia um, and realism during the art scene. Um, so some of the historiography and sources um, that I've used, um, unfortunately, the majority of uh, text sources, primary sources, um, were in Russian, as well as a lot of secondary sources um, on Alexei Savrasov himself uh, were written uh, in Russian, unfortunately. Um, there is a large section of English works um, on the group that he was a part of, the Pervishniki, um, but as far as English works on the biography of Savrasov and on his works, um, there is very little besides, you know, a little one paragraph uh, note in a book for a biography, or I think the longest I've seen is from a master's thesis from Anne Zacharias from the University of Berlin. Um, but other than that, a lot of secondary sources in English were very helpful, um, a lot by Elizabeth Faulkner and David Jackson. Um, so the basis of the project was looking at um, his works as the primary sources. Um, so the thesis is that by traveling abroad in 1862 um, to visit the International Exhibition in London um, and having extended stay in Switzerland afterwards, um, Savrasov sort of ignited his lyrical landscape style, um, which can be used to promote Russian realism and nationalism. And the image shown to the right um, is titled View of the Swiss Alps from Interlaken, and it was created in 1862 on his trip uh, abroad. And so some historical context that's a little bit necessary to know uh, that the average person might not know. Um, What's really important is looking at the history of the arts in Russia at the time, um, which was uh, mostly dominated by the Academy of Arts, which was created by Empress Catherine the Great. Um, and she had created it to model after the French Academy and was very hands off with it. It was to promote uh, Russian artists in their work. Um, by the 1800s um, and during Savrasov's time, uh, with Tsar Nicholas II that had drastically changed. Um, the Academy of Arts was moved directly into the imperial household, meaning that the imperial family had a direct hand over the Academy of Arts. And Nicholas II himself was very strict, and he promoted sort of the ideas of neoclassical uh, arts at the time. Um, and the thing about the Academy of Arts was that it was the only art institution in Russia that could give class rankings um, as far as social and economic status. So an artist's, an artist's success was gauged by his ability to go uh, to the Imperial Academy and win competitions in order to get a class status. Um, and the only other school at the time um, that was present and operating 
um, on a similar field was the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture, and Architecture that in itself was not able to offer um, class rankings until 1865. Um, and because of the sort of strict monopoly that the academy had on the art scene, um, a lot of artists rebelled against this, um, particularly in 1863 um, during the gold medal competition, which was the highest uh, competition that the Academy offered, um, a group of 14 artists um, decided that they would not participate. Um, because in these gold medal competitions, the artists were given um, a subject that they had to paint. They could not paint whatever they wanted. They were forced to paint a particular subject. And in this year, it was chosen that the subject would be Valhalla. And 14 of the artists agreed that this is not what they wanted to paint. Rather, instead, they would have preferred to paint um, scenes of Russian life. Um, and during the time, uh, realism in art uh, was uh, becoming very popular, so painting real life. Um, and so they chose to um, remove themselves from the competition and essentially remove themselves from being able to earn any class rankings. And they went on to form what is known as the Artel, um, which was a group of artists that lived together, that worked together. Um, they did have one exhibition in Novgorod, but the success that they had was not substantial. Um, it wasn't until the formation of the Perdivizhniki um, in 1869 um, that an art group emerged as um, being separate from the Academy of Arts in a successful way. And the Perdivision Key was formed by a group of artists, which included Alexei Savrasov, um, Vasily Perov, uh, Ivan Shishkin, uh, Ivan Komskoy. Um, and this art group was formed as strictly an economic venture um, that they would promote traveling art exhibitions. Um, and the only requirement to be part of this group was that you painted Russian art. And this was vague intentionally. Um, as a lot of the artists painted um, a lot of social realism pieces, um, that was not um, a requirement of the artists. They could paint just anything that was Russian life. Um, and Alexei Savrasov was one of the founders, so we shall get into him next. Um, so Savrasov was born in 1830 in Moscow to a merchant family. Um, so his family was pretty wealthy, they were not serfs, or uh, uh, he was not born to a peasant family. And he studied at the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture, and Architecture um, through the 40s and 50s under Professor Rabus, and eventually became an instructor of landscape painting in 1857. Um, and during his time, he uh, would have emulated the works of a lot of Dutch masters um, and a lot of 1700s uh, Western European artists. Um, and okay. um, so he became a professor in 1857 um, of this school after Rappus died. Um, he traveled abroad in 1862 um, to go visit the International Exhibition in London. And here he would have seen works from a very wide uh, variety of countries, which included a lot of Western European countries, as well as Turkey, Brazil, the United States, um, and Japan. So he was exposed to a very wide uh, range of styles and subjects. Um, while he was there afterwards, he had an extended stay in Switzerland, which is where he painted the piece previously shown um, of Interlaken. And that piece and other works that he created during that time were not well received by critics um, because they said that he did not know uh, the landscape and that he had not been there long enough to know the landscape. So essentially he could see what it is and he could paint it, but he did not know the culture and the people around the landscape that made it um, uh, sort of uh, quintessential to them. Um, and this image uh, is from 1854, um, titled View in the Neighborhood of Rambahan. Um, and the way that I picked the works was um, there was a Russian text 
um, that half of it was Russian about the life of Savrasov, which I could not read, and then the other half was a very comprehensive accumulation of his works. And so by looking through that, as well as through other sources of um, other texts that had works by him, as well as areas such as Art Store, what I did for the visual analysis part was I picked images um, that were typical of his style at the time. Um, and this piece here is very typical of his style. Um, he absolutely prefers a very cropped foreground. Um, there's the cloudy blue sky, um, autumn trees. And what's significant about this and about the works around this time is the fact that there is not a strict sense of identity in the piece. This could be um, from Russia, it could be from Western Europe. Um, there's no key way of telling, well, this is a Russian artist, and besides, you know, knowing the title and the name, um, there's no way of telling that this is a Russian artwork. And that sense of identity is something that Savrasov does not have until after his trip abroad. Um, so the next piece that we'll be looking at is sort of the quintessential uh, Alexei Savrasov piece, and it's probably his most well-known work. Um, it's titled The Rooks Have Come Back. Um, it was created in 1871 and was exhibited with the Peter Vishniki. And um, it still exhibits some of the same structure as the previous piece, the cropped foreground, the cloudy uh, blue sky. But here we see a much greater sense of identity. Um, that is done by the snow-covered landscape and especially by the architecture in the background. Um, specifically, the Onion Dome Church in the background, which is something that is very um, stylistically Russian. And um, here is where Savrasov has a true sense of identity starting in his pieces. Um, which is far different from the works created before he traveled abroad. Um, and here is where you also start to see a sense of his lyrical landscape painting style. And lyrical landscape painting style, I'll explain it a little bit more, uh, a little bit further down, um, but it's essentially telling a story. Um, and here we see there's movement by the birds, um, and things like that, and there's the presence of things other than landscape that say there's more to this picture than what is shown. Um, so this piece was really the start of his lyrical landscape style after he traveled abroad. So this image is titled Spring at Kitchen Gardens, and it was painted in 1893, uh, just before his death in 1897. And here, once again, we see the same, you know, cloudy uh, sky background, um, but here it's very different because this piece really exhibits the lyrical landscape style and the fact that it tells a story uh, because it's not just a uh, landscape of nature. What it is is a landscape that exhibits um, things like homes and fences, and in the previous piece, things like architecture. Um, so it's putting a stamp on the landscape of the people. And what that does is it tells a story without uh, the use of figures. Um, so it's not just uh, a landscape painting, it's one with the stamp of people on it uh, without actually showing figures. Um, and that's very different from, say, narrative uh, painting. An example that I've used here is that of Vasily Perov, who is also a member of the Third Vishniki. Um, and his style, he does a lot of figures in his painting. And then this one is highly narrative um, because you see that the figures tell the story. You have uh, the horse that's sort of hunched over and is a little bit emaciated. Um, you have the figure staring the sleigh that's hunched over, the children who are grasping the coffin and the dog that's sort of pointing forward, uh, looking at something new. Um, he absolutely uses figures to tell his story, um, which is different from Savrasov, who does not use the figures, but uses sort of the remnants of those living in the landscape to tell the story, using the homes, the churches, um, all the things that figures would have placed in the Russian landscape and adapted to the Russian landscape, um, rather than the actual inclusion of those figures. And this is something that he 
started after his trip abroad um, and really pushed after the trip abroad and pushed towards realism and nationalism in his work. Um, and as stated before, um, to be a member of the Pared Vishniki, um, the artists did not have to create works of uh, social realism uh, in their paintings. The only criteria was just to paint Russian art. Um, and by painting stories of people um, and what they use in the landscape and how they affect the landscape and how they adapted to it, um, Cyrusov painted realism in a sense of actually showing life in his works in a sense of social uh, realism in a more abstract way. So as where Perov uh, previously um, painted figures um, on their way to a village funeral, and as were those like Ilya Repin, who was another notable artist um, during the time and joined the Peredvishniki in uh, 78, who painted serfs and peasants. Savrasov paints sort of the landscape around those figures that they would have had. Um, and there is a sense of patriotism in this and love for one's country. Um, by renouncing sort of Western ideals that he was previously taught. Um, but it's also nationalism in a sense. And the key like Webster uh, definition for nationalism is the promotion uh, of the creation for an independent state. And I think that's a little bit too um, strict and guarded because in a sense it could also be, uh, for example, the creation of a separate community in an already established state or a drastic evolution of a state to create something new. And here we see the period Vishniki and Savrasov going against the Royal Academy and saying that they don't want to play by the Heinlein's rules. Um, they didn't want to exhibit what was told, but rather what was seen and what was in real life. And by doing so, advocated for a true um, Russia away from Western influence. And that's sort of how his pieces tie into realism and uh, nationalism by promoting this idea of a true Russia above what the Academy wanted him uh, to paint and what the Academy wanted artists um, to paint. And granted, the Pervishniki was not a political association, um, but when looking at the history of Russia later and looking at the creation of the Soviet Union where the Pervishniki um, pieces would be used on, say, Soviet postage stamps and whatnot, and as propaganda. This can be seen as a precursor um, and as a sort of muted sense of national nationalism as a whole, and Savrasov absolutely participates in that. So, I think that's about it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brooke. We really appreciate that. Um, as we have been doing on our uh, previous presentations, if you have questions, please uh, put them in the group chat um, and we will uh, attempt to have Brooke answer those. Um, I'll get started with one, Brooke, while um, people, and i just curious um, how you ended up choosing this particular artist. Okay, so, what was it about him? How did you come to, yeah. Um, so when I eventually, when I first started working with Dr. Marie on my thesis, she told me, you know, come up with a list of things that you want to work on. And I came up with a list of like 15 different things that included like Suji Gahana Komodos, um, shubing and things like that. And one of the things that I had on the list was the specific painting, The Books Have Come Back. Um, that was a piece that I saw in Dr. Marie's early 20th century art class um, on a website, by, I think it was Khan Academy. And they had the image listed, but they didn't really have much information on it. And so when that was on the list, we were like, yes, this is something that we can work through. And we started by looking at Cybersaw's Wikipedia page, and Dr. Marie suggested looking at the international exhibition because there might be English sources. And unfortunately, there were not. <laughs> Uh, uh, that's just sort of how we molded it down. Cool. So Wade says he loves nature artworks, spends a lot of time outdoors. So he's curious as to which of those that you researched was your favorite and also which was your least favorite. Um, definitely 
The Rooks Have Come Back was my absolute favorite. That as, long, uh, as well as the work with Ivan Shishkin, uh, the ones with the bears in the forest. I think that one's just really beautiful. Um, so those were probably my top two favorite. As far as least favorite, um, probably the first 1854 uh, image that I showed, uh, The Neighborhood, um, as well as one other work that he did, I believe in 1862, which has uh, a figure sitting under a tree, which is just like a storybook image. It didn't have a lot of life to it, and it wasn't very intricate and detailed and didn't have a large sense of identity. And it was those two pieces that I was like, eh, I could take it or leave it. Okay. Um, he also wondered which was the most difficult to find research on. Um, most of the images that I used came out of that one accumulation of uh, photos in the Russian book uh, that I looked at. And most of the research that I did was um, looking at visually how the images differed. Um, so as far as researching the actual pieces, um, the book had a lot of the titles and the years and things like that. So that wasn't difficult, but finding, um, probably the most difficult thing to research was the background information on Savrasov rather than the actual visual images and things like that. Okay. Um, and so to sort of follow up, you may have answered this, but Dr. Martinez asks um, a little bit about um, whether you had any other research roadblocks in attempting to finish your project. Yes. So with the language barrier, um, another roadblock that I had was in describing his sense of lyrical landscape style. Um, that's something that a lot of authors have used in their like little short paragraphs about his biography, saying that he started the lyrical landscape style in Russia. But unfortunately, there was no key definition of what that was. Um, most of the things that I researched about lyrical landscape are pointing me back to English and Chinese poetry. So I had to sit down with Dr. Murray and ask, how do I define this without being able to find a definition? Because it exists, but there's no definition. And she said, define it by what it's not. What is it not? And what it's not is narrative painting. And that's how I sort of define that. So that was definitely a big block that I had. Okay. So Dr. Murray, he has, she says, do you think that something that distinguishes his work from the other Peridzniki, I apologize for the mispronunciation <laughs> there, um, is a sense of hope, especially with the kitchen garden image, which imparts a sense of future abundance, as opposed to, say, the very despondent images from Peroff or Rapin? Um, I think so, in a way, yes, because landscape is something that's, I don't want to say eternal, because it absolutely changes, but the way that we affect a landscape uh, has a much more uh, stronger endurance for the fact that it will be there in 50 years, as were, say, um, the works of Repin, um, who, I can't quite think of the name of the work, but he painted um, a parade where there was peasants and serfs, and it was not so um, uplifting, in a sense that a lot of the social reform pieces are pointing out the negative sides of society. And yes, they're saying like, we need to work on this, but it's not as uh, long of an endurance as say a landscape and things like that. Okay, so Dr. Starkey has a, a couple of, and so we'll, so she said, why were at least some Russian artists emulating the works of 1600s and 1700s Europe, such as the Dutch still life of the 1840s and, and 50s? Why not emulate work from some other time period or culture? Um, so from what I found, uh, Empress Catherine the Great, she, when she had started the Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg, what she did was she based it off of the French salon as an ideal. And going through, um, up through Nicholas II, um, it was sort of hands off, but as soon as he uh, got a hold of it, he promoted specifically neoclassicism. So that was something that was very strictly um, had to be abided by. And he was very, you know, he would visit the studio artists and see what they were doing in person. So he had a very uh, authoritarian aspect to that. Um, so between being modeled after the French Salon and then Nicholas II's hand in it, um, that's mostly why I would say they sort of emulated the European styles 
Um, also in the fact that it was oil painting. Um, and so that would be another reason. Okay, thanks. Um, the second part of that question is from Dr. Starkey is whether you found any influence of Romanticism on his work after 1862. Um, as far as Romanticism, um, I think that there can be a link established there, but that's not something that I really um, looked into or really saw in his works uh, when looking at them. Okay. Um, looking to see if, and at the moment I don't see any other questions. I was curious, um, just your thought about, um, or maybe maybe the better question is, um, you mentioned, you talked a great deal about the fact that um, he discovered his sense of identity, or at least it became apparent in his paintings after he returned from abroad. Yeah. Does, does he, and I don't know if you can answer this because of the question of sources and things, and so maybe why you think that happened, and does he talk about it at all? Or is there any discussion among others as to why this happened? Um, the only source that I really have, uh, I don't have any sources for as far as what he spoke right. about. Um, I also can't find any Russian sources for anything that he spoke about. They're mostly secondary sources, uh, or the ones in Russian. Um, but Ian Zacharias uh, created uh, for his master's thesis, I believe at the University of Berlin, he looked at both Savrasov and Shishkin studying abroad. Um, and that was the main basis of his thesis. And there was about two pages dedicated to Savrasov. And in it, um, he mentions that, you know, he visited um, Colome and that he didn't really um, get much out of visiting other artists while abroad. Um, and inferring that sort of the way that one would paint a Western landscape is far different from how one would paint an Eastern landscape. And sort of looking at, um, sort of by looking at the Western artists, he kind of learned what not to do and trying to find a greater sense of Russian identity rather than trying to once again emulate the Western artists. Thank you very much. Okay, it looks like um, our questions have been completed. I haven't seen any new come up. So I wanna thank you, Brooke very much for your presentation. You. Appreciate it greatly. Um, and so this concludes um, our online portion of our 13th annual conference, virtual 2020. I don't know if you can see, Brooke, you're getting lots of clapping up there. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Um, so thank you all for coming. I really appreciate, uh, we really appreciate everybody's support. Um, and again, remember that this takes place every year, so I encourage you, but also more importantly, um, spread the word, have people go on the website, check out all the other presentations as well. Um, there's a lot of really cool work that has been done um, by our students, supported by all of you, our faculty, and so we want to um, encourage that. And again, thank you all for being here today. Um, I think it was a good effort for our first try, and uh, so thank you all, and stay well, and we will talk again soon. So thank you, everybody. Take care.